This is a lesson I've been excited about for a while. Today, we'll be taking audio stems from this track and using their volume data to automate movement for a drumming character. If you've ever tried to animate drumming or anything really syncopated with audio, you'll know that uh, it can sometimes be very complicated and being able to automate it completely using the audio track, it's amazing. Um, this is part of an ongoing series of advanced character rigging and animation for a music visualizer to accompany Brigantine Party Machine, a track by my good friend and collaborator, Captain Blackwood. I'm so pumped to get started, so let's do it. So I'm over here in my goon rig. You'll recognize this from some of the other tutorials, potentially. One thing that is, or two things that are new is I've changed the hands out. I've swapped them out with new hands. Uh, so he can be drumming with these bones on uh, some new drums that I've also added to the scene. They're really just photos of casks that I've squashed a little bit, and uh, they look pretty perfect for an intergalactic pirate ship. So they got that going for them. Anyway, um, starting out, I just want to have give you a brief word on audio tracks. Uh, so audio stems are the most important part of this automated character rig. Uh, you really need super clean audio tracks. And uh, this song in particular, it was done mostly with MIDI. So MIDI tracks are ideal because they're pretty uniform and there's usually a lot less noise in between peaks of the audio. Uh, so the track that I'm going to be using here Brigantine Party Machine, you can get a sample. Some good old pirate metal. Uh, it's got a lot of guitars, bass, keyboards, etc. going on, but it's very percussion heavy and I'm focusing on the percussion because those tracks in particular work very well for automating animation. So today I'm going to be taking the click sound here. I'll be using that, which is a rounded click I've requested because I found that a rounded click sound adds a little bit of a, an ease in and out of the animation, which is helpful. And we're also going to be taking, let's see, this sound. And we're going to be using those two individual tracks to drive all the animation in this character. So I'm going to select those tracks right now and drag them into my project. And then I will drag them into my composition right up top. It's nice to know where they are and um, they're already got their own color code going on so I don't need to mess with that but I do want to shut them off except for the click and with only the click highlighted I'm gonna right click and go to keyframe assistant convert audio to keyframes this will create a no layer which I can drag off to the side here and rename this is click audio <clears throat> So if I open this click, and you can see the waveform, this is a super clean waveform. Um, in the effect, we have three channels, the left, the right pan, and then both channels. I only need both channels for this particular track, so I'm going to delete the other two, and essentially just try to give you an idea of what is being extrapolated here. So when you see this peak go up, you're going to notice that the value over here on the slider for click audio goes up as well. And it looks like it goes up to about 20 and then comes down to zero again. This is a really, really useful track right here. Essentially, 
Um, I can. Uh, I plan to make the the character bob his head along to the music, and using the click track, that's easy as pie. But now that that's done, I can actually silence that track and move on to the next one, which is the drum track. When you are using the keyframe assistant to create audio keyframes, you only want one selected at a time. This way you can isolate each one. If I had all three open, it's gonna create keyframes for all three in one file, and uh, I don't want that. So right click, keyframe assistant, convert audio to keyframes. And with this one, I'm gonna call this drum audio. And I don't wanna delete any of the layers in this one because uh, my good friend, Captain Blackwood, has gone through the trouble of hard panning this track, um, left and right. So basically, he's alternating the strikes of the drum between left and right speaker. And because of that, I can actually use the left channel and the right channel to power the left and the right arm. <clears throat> so each one acts independently. And that is really key in selling this effect, making it look less robotic and making it a very natural drum pattern, which is the way a drummer would play it. So I got both of those set up. I want to expose the stopwatches for all of these because I am going to be pick whipping to get to those. But I can shut off all these audio tracks right now and move on to the next step, which is going to be prepping my rig. So the only thing I really need to do to prep this rig is I wanted to add an expression to the hands so that they actually move with kind of a roll on the arm. Right now, as I will demonstrate, you'll see that they're very rigid. And this looks okay, but he just kind of looks like a caveman bashing the drums. And while that is entertaining, uh, I would like him to have a more natural roll to his wrist. Um, so the first part of that is going to be connecting the rotation property of this new hand to the rotation of the elbow, which is actually a null right here. So I'm exposing both of those. I'm gonna go into the left hand and left click, alt, left click rotation to open the expression panel. And all I wanna do is plus sign and pick whip to the rotation of the elbow. And this simply, simply put, this is going to add the rotation of the elbow the value of that on top of the uh, the value of the rotation of the wrist right now, or the, the hand, I should say. So without any of that there, the wrist was in a normal position. And now whenever the elbow moves, whenever the rotation of the elbow moves, the wrist also moves. It's a little too extreme that way, so I want to tone it down and the way I will do that is at the end of the expression, I'm going to multiply it all by 0.6. So this will simply take 60% of the elbow rotation value and add that to the rotation of the hand. Thus creating a fairly natural roll to the wrist. But I can take this a step further and actually add the value at time expression. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna delay the hand roll by one frame. You can delay it by as many frames as you want, but I would like to delay it by one frame. So every time the elbow moves, the wrist moves one frame after. So going at the end of this transform.rotation element, I'm gonna add a period and the value at time expression, which is value capital A at capital T time parentheses and now I'm going to take time minus 1 divided by 24 and to break this down uh, this is the value of the left elbow rotation 
and it's the time, the overall time, minus one frame because this is one divided by 24, 24 frame per second composition. So it's a delay of one frame. And then taking that value and multiplying it by 0.6. So if I keyframe this, it should show a delay in the hand movement. I'm going to try that right now. My computer's been acting screwy, so this may give me some trouble. We'll see. So you can see here, one frame after, and it keeps moving. So it's just like an over swing. I could make it two, it'd be a little more apparent, but actually one is all I need. And with that, I'm gonna copy this expression and apply it to the right hand. <clears throat> so let's find that bad boy. And selecting the rotation parameter, control, left click, I'm gonna copy paste it. Now, the only change I need to make because I have a right elbow layer in this file, is I just need to change the left elbow to right elbow. And now that should do the same thing, which it seems to. But this hand is actually connected to the wrist and I want it connected to the other hand. So I'm gonna take care of that real quick. Yeah. Because this is going to be moving on its own, um, there will be some overextension of the arm, and I'm limiting that by attaching it in the actual IK chain. So that looks good. Now I can get to actually automating the animation, which is the most exciting part of this whole thing. So I'm going to start by automating the wrists. I want to make sure that the position property of each wrist is actually separated so that X and Y have their own property. So I'm going to right click the position of each one and separate dimensions. That now breaks it into two. Same goes here. I only want to affect the Y position of each of these. I want the wrists to go up and down and I need that to be signaled by the value of the drum audio. So now that I have separated them, I have the right arm selected. I'm going to all left click on the Y position here. <clears throat> and then plus, I'm gonna add the value of the right channel here. And this should move in unison with that channel. I'm actually going to turn on the drum sound so we can see in here. And usually at first there's a bit of a lag, so it might be off time, but it should actually line up. And that appears to be working pretty well. Super weak. Um, really at its strongest, it looks like the value of the right channel is in the vicinity of eight. So I need way more than that to actually move this thing in a substantial way. Um, so I'm gonna actually multiply this by like 40. And that's kind of a lot, but uh, let's see. And that looks really good. <laughs> it's so exciting to see that, you know, it's really, really cool. Uh, but you can notice that because I've multiplied it so much, uh, that really amplifies the value of all of it. And because it's not a zero value in between those peaks, um, you get a little bit of wobbliness with the animation. And we don't want that. We want this guy to look like a very confident drummer, not nervous at all behind the drums. So. 
I'm going to further expand on this by adding the if else expression. Um, it's going to sound very complicated. I'm not going to do a good job of explaining this in a simple way, but it is fairly simple once you understand this expression. So I suggest to anybody, if you're having trouble with it, study the if else expression. There's unlimited uses for it. It's really, really cool. So basically what I want to tell this wrist is that when the value of the right channel here is under a certain value, let's say in this case, if it's, so I can see here, it's usually under one, but I'm going to say like, if it's under two, then it shouldn't be moving at all. And then if it's over two, if the value is over two, like here it's 7.75, then it should be using this expression that I've created here. So I'm going to select this expression and to start, I'm going to control X. I'm cutting it. I'm not deleting it. I'm just cutting it and saving it to the clipboard. And I'm going to start my if else expression. So if defining my conditional value here, <clears throat> I'm going to pick whip up here to the right channel. If the right channel value is less than two, close parentheses, and then the, I want to write transform dot Y capital P position. And all that's saying is that the Y position will remain where it's at. Then I add my false statement, else, and inside parentheses, I can paste my initial expression. And what that should give me is a confident swing. And it's done exactly that, as advertised. So um, now I can, I can find the extreme here when the arm is, uh, actually <laughs> that lines up pretty perfectly, so I don't even need to move it, but I could move this to pretty much land where I want it to at the extreme position because that's where it's going to end up every time. And don't mind these little jitters here. I don't know what the f is going on right now with After Effects, but it is acting really funky. And uh, don't mind that. That is just After Effects. The goat has eaten too much grass. <laughs> well, I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing for the other wrist. And I'm copy pasting here, and I can alter it where I need to. So. Alt left click in the Y position and I'm just going to replace that. Now instead of right channel, I know I want that to be the left channel. And I will change that again here. Left channel. Otherwise I think it should be good to go. So that's going to do the exact same thing except it's using the opposite channel. And now they should be simultaneously. Yeah. That's like magic, you know? I do need to switch this hand around though, so let's find the extreme position here. Looks like it's about here, so I'm gonna move his arm to where it would be striking this barrel, about here. And that actually works pretty well, um, but he still does look a little bit robotic. So now I got some other stuff I can add here. Uh, before anything, I do want to add a responsive hit to this barrel, to both the barrels. Uh, so I'm going to find them in here. So I want to be able to affect just the up and down here. 
value of the scale. So what I'm going to do is alt left click on the scale and for transform scale I want to subtract and then I'll create an array here with square brackets you can create an array. I don't want to do anything to the first parameter here so for that I'm going to put zero that will subtract nothing from that parameter. From the second parameter I want to be subtracting the value of the left drum audio. So I'll go up to that slider and select that. And let's see how that operates here. So it works and it works okay. Not ideal, but that's okay. I'd like it to be a little bit more extreme. So inside these brackets, I can actually just multiply that by three to give it a stronger value overall. And that looks good enough. But I also want to add a, an if and expression so that it doesn't have the shaking in between. So what I'm going to do is select this and cut it. Now it's in my clipboard. I'm going to start with if define my conditional statement, which is going to be selecting the left channel again. If the value of the left channel is less than, I believe I used two last time. If it's less than two, then true value will be transform scale. So it will stay the same. Space, else, and then the fault statement, I will paste the expression that I copied here. And that will um, get rid of the little wiggles in between. And I think that's all I'm going to be using the drum sound for. That's probably, that's probably as complicated as I'm going to get. Uh, now I want to take the click audio and I want to start using that for some of the some of the other elements here. I want to make him tap in his foot. I want to make him bob in his head and kind of swaying his body. So let me start with the hips here. I'm going to have him sway back and forth using the click audio. So I've got the hip controller selected and this one's actually already split. So I want to use the X position here and I'm simply going to add the value of the click and see what happens. Gives a decent little sway. I don't actually want more than that, so that's enough right there. And let's see what it looks like. When I do the same thing with the Y position, I just change the X value to Y and let me double it. So he'll go up and down more than he goes side to side. That looks all right. I'm gonna actually multiply the X value by negative one so he goes backwards instead of forwards. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, cool. He looks very happy right now, don't you think? <clears throat> so now we'll do something similar with the toe here.
And lastly, I want to affect this head controller. Again, this is already separated and it's already in position. So um, I'm going to just be pasting this same. Oh, I guess I won't be pasting that expression, but maybe I should. Um, So I'm copying the expression from the hip and adding it to the head. But I'll add it to the X position first. X capital P position. And uh, I think that's the wrong, maybe the wrong direction and also probably not extreme enough. So yeah, let's multiply the whole thing by like seven. Yeah, okay. With the Y position, I might need to alter this a little bit. It's easy enough to do if I need to. Yeah, I think I want a value at time on here as well. So, uh, say a two frame. negative value on that. This hip is like probably a little too extreme with the rotation. So minus 0.2. Yeah, and now all these time delays, I mean, it's really like slowing, bogging my system down, but. That looks cool. And hopefully you could see here where certain values will actually affect the overall performance of the rig. Um, it's essentially down to time delays and the multiplication of the value of these audio keyframes. That's it. Um, other than that, uh, it should all be pretty straightforward where you plug it in, what you want to do. Uh, maybe you want them jumping up and down. You can add a time delay to a global position. Um, maybe you want them hitting another character. You know, so you, again, you're just adding a time delay that's going to correlate with every hit of the hand. Once you start really playing around with it, the possibilities are endless. Uh, you can really affect a lot of different properties and you can do so pretty naturally, you know. Hope you liked it. Hope you had some fun and big special thank you to Captain Blackwood for helping out with everything. And uh, like I said, he's made a mini tutorial on how you want to pre prepare your audio files. So I'm linking that in the bottom. Uh, and stay tuned for the next in the series. Take care.